on the road. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> ah. Can we sign up someone else who that takes a photo and you sit on the panel? <laughs> Sissy? Where is Sissy? Sorry? Where is Sissy? Oh, that's very nice. Oh. Ah, Sissy? Can you do this photo? Machen? Yeah, with including you. Okay, see this. Ah, okay. <coughs> Everyone there? Can you hear me? Yeah, good. <laughs> Esteemed guests in the auditorium, um, dear online participants, um, dear panelists, um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the workshop and panel discussion today um, with the topic Data Driven Democracy Ensuring Values in the Internet Age. My name is Tobias Redlich, and I'm a researcher at the Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg, and my research deals with patterns of collaborative value creation, and I'm a member of a German institution called Young Forum Technical Sciences, JF Tech. And this um, JF Tech, the Young Forum, is also represented today by other members um, in the panel, like Matthias and Elke and Kalman. And I'm going to facilitate the panel discussion not alone, but together with Sissi, who's in the back, and with Ita Beleng to my left, and Ita Beleng Chabana. She's a cybersecurity archi architect uh, for Vodacom Lesotho. And uh, Sissi, Sissi V. Basmar, um, she is scientific director of the JF Tech office, as well as a researcher at the Helmut Schmidt University in Hamburg. And both will support me facilitating the discussion, not only with you, but also with the online community. Digital applications based on algorithms and analysis, analysis of big data support our everyday lives today. However, data can and have been misused. At present, humans have to adapt to technology, but it should be that technology um, ought to be adapted to users and society in the long term. So this workshop proposes a viable shift from technology-centric um, to human-centered development of technology, which is also one of the goals of JF Tech. Some of the key questions are, and you have seen them hopefully um, on the screen already in my back, some of the questions are, who holds the data necessary for democratic decision making? Who can support, uh, how can we support digital sovereignty based on democratic values? Or what influence do filter bubbles and algorithms have on our social coexistence? So together with a panel, experts, we will discuss the above and hopefully more questions and consider different positions to analyze the actual um, influence of AI, algorithms, and filter bubbles on our society. We want to support a dynamic presentation and discussion of the main diverse points by interacting with you, the auditorium, and also with the online community. And we will reserve 60 minutes of the panel um, for the particip participation of all of you and the exchange with the auditorium and this online and on site. So if you have a question, um, please go to one of the microphones and uh, then please tell your name and your background and then raise your question. We try to integrate the questions from the audiences during the whole session. But within the next 20 minutes, I'd like, and I have to, the great pleasure to introduce our panelists, or better, I will give them the opportunity to introduce themselves. And therefore, please keep in mind, the panelists, um, to not extend three minutes for each individual introduction and a brief statement so that we can dive into the discussion with the audiences right after. Okay. First, 
to my far right, Dr. Matthias Kettemann. Matthias is the head of the research program Regulatory Structures and the Emergence of Rules in Online Spaces at Leibniz Institute for Media Research, and he's also interim professor at the University of Heidelberg. Matthias, please tell us more about your work and answer maybe the following question. What does data governance mean to you? Hi, thank you, thank you very much. I really hate to be on the far right in any situation, but um, <laughs> especially here. So let me move uh, towards the middle of, uh, of, of society in, 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 in regulating data. Um, I have worked on rules for, for quite some time, rules in online spaces. What I found out was that many of the questions on how to best create rules are very much dependent on data resources, on questions of data management and data governance on at least three levels, on the societal level, on the organizational level, and on the level of individuals. It is important to note at the outset that we do not have a one-size-fits-all solution to data governance. There are certain key standards uh, on how to uh, use data in a human rights sensitive way without uh, um, endangering uh, societal uh, cohesion that have developed uh, from the uh, principles of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development to the data uh, principles of the Council of Europe to uh, the data minimization rules uh, contained in key um, normative instruments um, on both sides of the Atlantic. However, I feel that we're still not there yet to understand conceptually the key challenge of data. There are so many misunderstandings regarding uh, who should own data. If owning is a concept that is worth considering, the uh, recent Data Ethics Commission, for instance, said that in Germany said that data ownership was a concept that shouldn't be used at all. We rather have to talk about uh, common usage uh, rights and how the um, question of data um, use and data protection interacts with the larger questions of realizing societal goals. Sometimes it makes much sense to uh, demand data if uh, states can make better decisions. But the question I have um, come across very often is uh, who, uh, is, uh, who holds the data necessary to make good and uh, sustainable uh, normative decisions. And very often, data is held by private parties. So what I see as the key challenge for data governance is to develop, a, um, to develop an approach on how to socialize uh, data access. I don't think we should um, force companies, for instance, to open up all algorithms, but it would be an important uh, added value to ensure that the freedom of information uh, law that has been applied with much success uh, against uh, states for the last two and uh, three decades, that something along those lines is developed for companies. And the good news is that most of them aren't even opposed to that. Um, when you talk, for instance, to representatives of Google, they are rather open towards uh, giving access to the data they have, so for instance, uh, geographical data, because they also see that there is an added value in sharing. And I think if data governance does good, it has to develop uh, added value for societies and for individuals as well. Thank you. Yes. Our next panelist is um, Professor Dr. Elke Greifeneder. Elke? Um, may provide us insights from human information behavior research and user experience design. She is a deputy director of the Berlin School of Library and Information Science and head of the research group Information Behavior. Elke, please introduce us to your work and answer maybe the following question. What means data driven? And uh, why do you think, well, it's two questions, why do you think technology has to adapt to people and not the other way around? Why do I get two questions? And I only have three minutes, so um, thank you very much for uh, having me here. Um, I'm professor for library and information science, so I'm rather an unusual panel member here. But we, I come from a background where we have centuries long ago experience with a lot of data, 
and with no data that we just collected, but that we want to refine and be able to reuse. So we need to talk about structured data. And when we talk about data-driven democracy, we have to talk about structured data, because otherwise we will not find it again. Um, technology needs to adapt to users. Um, I don't think that this works. So my expertise is in information behavior, so how people use and interact with information. And uh, while we believe and like to believe that we just have to develop the best working system, the users will use it in the end how they want to. So when we talk about data-driven democracy, we have to keep that in mind that even the best system might not be used like the um, developers want it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist is Gustavo Paiva. Um, Gustavo is a member of Brazil's Attorney Order Commission on Digital Law and IT. His main topic of research, because he's also a researcher, is anonymity on the net and its protection under Brazil's constitutional law. Gustavo, please tell us what kind of political or legal norms would have to be shaped um, into a future internet governance, in your opinion. Hello. Hello. As our moderator said, my name is Gustavo. I come from a mixed civil society and academic background. I'm here thanks to the Youth Summit. And uh, my answer to these questions is, some, is somewhat straightforward. I think we have to discuss the way data, data relates to platforms and AI. Um, I have a short case I would just like to mention here. It, it is about a senator from my, my state. His name is Senator Vince, Vincent Stevenson Valentin. And he was victim in his campaign to um, a series of computer-generated disinformation. And of course, this kind of AI-based technology comes from, from lot of lots of massive volume of data. So in this, of course, impacts directly our democracy. So I think it is in the next few years, it should be a priority in the IGF and in other forums to discuss how data and AI and platforms interact. Thank you for this great example. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Nadine Abdallah. Nadine delivers thoughts from the field of political transformation, youth movements, and how basic political principles might influence the debate. She is an assistant professor of socio uh, sociology at the American University in Cairo. Nadine, tell us about your work and please answer the following question. Is social media the right channel to support democratic processes around the world? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm working basically on social movements and bottom-up approaches to uh, democracy and uh, socio-political transformation, and this is what we have been witnessing in the Arab uprising lately. Um, as for the question, I think I will think of much a contradict contradictory statement or much of a paradox that I would like to raise here in the um, debate, which is that social media has supported, of course, democratic uh, 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 has supported uprising. Uh, it was a significant tool for uh, mobilization during, during the Arab uprisings. Um, it has also helped a lot of movement to mobilize, like Podemos in Spain, like in uh, Black Lives Matter in the US, uh, during also the Arab uprising of 2011. However, um, when it comes to building a democracy, a democracy, when it comes to building consensus, social media didn't appear to fare well. So in this case, we can see that cluster of like-minded people who have been formed all over the world. Uh, this has been experienced in US, uh, where polarization were witnessed uh, in Egypt after uh, 2011, where there was more mobilization of fear than mobilization of consensus via social media because of the formation of cluster of like-minded people uh, that are rarely interacting within themselves. Uh, in Syria, this has been witnessed as well, uh, where we have seen the building of narratives of, of fear and the fool, uh, fo fooling violence and uh, also sectarianism via uh, social media. So at last I would say that yes, it is supporting uh, mobilization, yes, it is supporting a, ch a channel for grievances. However, when it comes to the time of building a real democracy based on institutional and conventional politics, in this case, we can see a, a certain paradox, which is the formation of clusters of like-minded people via the, the algorithm of social media and so on and so forth. And in this case, it's not so helpful uh, uh, to mobilize consensus via social media. Thank you. Thank you 
for your insights, um, Nadine. Uh, the next panelist is Dr. Kalman Gaffi. Kalman is a principal scientist at Honda Research Institute Europe, and uh, he is an expert on topics such as IT security, data governance, privacy preserving computation, and communication. So Kalman, we have been talking about rules, norms, regulation, regulation so far, and um, social media. Do you think technological innovation may also help to overcome the already stated problems? Um, yeah, thank you, Tobias. So I must uh, say I've been prior to working for Honda, also a professor for technology of social networks in Dusseldorf. So I um, have a long background on uh, researching new technologies that might take influence on how societies interact. And somehow my perspective is that still technology is one driving motor into how uh, the interactions take place. I mean, because you have Twitter and you have Facebook, you can interact that way. And that's why it's um, interesting to see what novel technologies might be out there that help us in uh, maybe solving the problems that we have nowadays. And there are some solutions uh, that, for example, allow to um, come up with, to, to process data, to, to analyze data without having the data. So topics like um, uh, privacy preserving computing based on homomorphic encryption based on garbled encrypted circuits and uh, differential privacy they all deal with uh, lots of encryption but the main idea is that you before sending out your data you encrypt it or you somehow distort it in a way that the receiver cannot see it cannot interpret it but still can do valuable and reasonable calculations on it to, for example, create statistics out of it. So that your individual data is not recognizable again, um, but the, the data of the community is reasonable, the statistics that you get out of it. And another point is also how the communications in the social networks take place, because uh, like Nadine said, it is taking impact on how the democratic movements uh, evolve. There are also research uh, fields going on to, to analyze what can we do better, because one of the problem fields that I and we analyzed in the Düsseldorf Institute for Internet Democracy is that one big challenge is that you always have this linear view of the argumentations. So if you have a 100 times a bad argument, it's over running the good ones. And if you would have a other visualization of the arguments and the facts and the, the points that are discussed, maybe in a mind map, I mean, there are other options to visualize such a conversation, such a discourse. It would help the people to really identify um, also the, the, the uh, less and rarely said good arguments that uh, might change the discussion. So technology and research in new technologies that allow privacy-preserving computing and also to support democratic um, discourses in the internet would help us to overcome maybe the challenges that we have nowadays. Thank you. Thanks. Um, our next panelist is Jessica Berlin. Jessica is a security and foreign policy expert who turned sustainable business and development innovator. Um, and as a founder and managing director of Coastract, uh, she advises governments, companies, multilaterals, and nonprofit organizations on strategy. Jessica, um, what is your experience um, um, from a practical perspective, do you tackle those questions in your work, and how important are those questions in different regions in the world? Uh, thanks for that. Uh, so, as Tobias said, I am not an academic. I'm not a researcher. Um, rather, I'm a practitioner in Dua who is constantly asking the question, how do we leverage and connect the resources and infrastructure of the public and private sector to solve global challenges? And in this space, uh, to answer your question around what does this mean across the world, it means that context is everything. Um, when we talk about data-driven democracy and what is it going to take to build an inclusive, sustainable digital infrastructure to enable an equitable society, that means a different thing in Germany than it does in China, than it does in the US, than it does in Sierra Leone that it does in Zimbabwe, that it does in Brazil. Because depending on who your government is, depending on uh, who is holding the veto cards in their hand to determine what happens in the regulatory environment um, and who gets to own data and use it for what ends, uh, completely and fundamentally uh, changes how you want to 
how you want to build solutions and strategies to this. So coming from the, the broadly stated Western world, uh, we are having different debates about this than activists and digital innovators in countries with less robust democratic institutions. So this is an issue that needs to be addressed uniquely and context-based in each region. Uh, and we have to have as a starting point in these discussions, regardless of whether we're policymakers uh, in the private sector or in academia, to recognize who are we answering this question for? When we talk about ensuring values, whose values and who decides? And how do those values differ from place to place? And how must that inform our strategy? Thank you, Jessica. So after introducing the panelists, I would give you the floor now, um, the audience. And um, I'm looking to Itabi Lang and Sissi. Do we already have incoming questions from the online community too? Um, once again, I want to repeat, if you have a question, please stand up, go to one of the microphones. And, uh, and before raising a question, please introduce yourself short with a name and where you're from. Um, but when uh, you're figuring, Hello? while you're figuring out your questions, <laughs> Uh, um, we did a little poll uh, okay. to uh, to look uh, with the online uh, participative community uh, who is participating, and we have 50% uh, uh, from the technical community, 33% uh, from the civil society, and 17% from the private sector. Please send us your questions. <laughs> okay. Last call. No. <laughs> okay. So, Thank you. So Thank you, Sissy. So, uh, do we have already a question from the honor committee? No. None so far so. We come back to the audience in the room. Otherwise, I would raise my first question. Please use one of the microphones. Anything? Uh, okay, now. My name is Arlette. I'm working for the German Development Corporation. It's a question for Jessica uh, and the, all the others who feel. Um, the contextualization that you said is so important. I mean, I completely agree. Um, and also, I have to say, all the panels that we've seen so far, uh, they are very white. And uh, there, there is not so much contextualization on the panels, maybe. But what I wanted to ask is, you know, uh, uh, translating it into practical terms. How, you know, what, how, what would be a way to go about it? Because you know, the more options you have, the less manageable it becomes. Yeah, that's an excellent question. In a single word, ask, yeah? Inclusion, you need to ask the people you are ostensibly designing for, right? And if you don't know who that is, ask, find out, you know, um, country by country, sector by sector, context by context, you know, ask yourself, who is already active in this space? who do I know is active in the space and talk to those people and find out maybe who do I not know that I don't know? What don't I know, don't I know? Because this, um, when we're coming from large multilateral or bilateral institutions and on this big global macro policy uh, design level, uh, we often don't know what we don't know, especially when we're talking about grassroots innovation or digital communities uh, where uh, there's just such a, a, a gap between uh, the culture of those organizations and the culture of the large institutions. So, you know, find people who build bridges between those spaces and find out who you should be talking to that you haven't. Uh, and, and I mean, I see this so many times, uh, you know, because I, in, in my function, um, you know, through Construct, bridge, building those bridges is a lot of what I do. And Often, I, you know, you have a partner from some major institution and they don't know the key local players working on it, but they've been in there for months and months or even more than a year. And so those conversations aren't being had, people are not being included who are actually key to the process. So um, even the fact that you ask that question is already an excellent sign um, and encouraging your, your colleagues and other partners to, to do the same. Okay, one more answer from Matthias. Just a short, short comment on that. Um, I think that the potential of, of, of data for development is really untapped until now. Um, if you talk to, to, to data, uh, sorry, to development experts with a lot of, um, a lot of ministries, they 
perhaps do not yet grasp exactly how they can use data, especially open source data, to make their uh, development policies more, uh, more, more efficient and more effective. Um, I've come across uh, so many great examples where um, people from, uh, from local communities uh, use, for instance, open access mapping to uh, show where the sewers were, to make them, uh, to put themselves literally on the map. Because we should never forget that when we talk about, you know, data minimization and you know, the importance of who has access to data, this is coming from a very privileged position. You know, we have so much data that it's almost dangerous if. Uh, if people, if, if, if states know too much about us, but there are also a huge part of the world uh, who has, who, who doesn't produce data, who is, which is non-existent in the datafied sphere. Simply put, if uh, you are not visible to your state, you will not receive a license, you will not receive a birth certificate, you will never receive money. Uh, in certain societies, you won't be able to board a bus, perhaps in a couple of years. So producing some data can also be extremely beneficial for development. So we have to keep that in mind, that data really is nothing good or bad, it is always and ever what we do with the data. And especially in development policies, I think we really have to critically think about how to use data in a better way. Thank you. Another comment from Gustavo. Um, Matthias' comment about socialization of data earlier in the session, I think it came at the best possible time. Just a few hours ago in the main session, we had, uh, we had Brian Fishman, a Facebook representative, and he had this comment that uh, quite often, Facebook is, is very excited and eager to share their data sets with people. And they, have, they even have an initiative, I think it's called Social Science One, that works exactly with that. But they don't know if they can, and lots of it falls into gray, ar gray areas of, of the GDPR. So I think that is really, that is really the socialization of data, so, so more grassroots projects so more students and or in initiatives can enjoy um, this, lab, this kind of training data. I think that is very important. And there is a little bit of my personal reality that I would like to share in this, in this regard. I teach quite often in, in, uh, in the northeast of Brazil. And there was this time, and there is a little bit of context here. In the southeast of Brazil, there is a very intense debate about data protection. We, we just recently approved the, our, our general data protection law. But in the Northeast, the perspective is very different. And even in, in college, even in well-educated groups, um, people don't actually care too much about data protection. And in fact, if you frame it in any other way, for example, facial recognition, and uh, people are quite, quite eager to have facial recognition for security purposes. Um, there is a, quite a bit of approval when I, I went to classes and asked about it. They, they, they mu would much rather have face security and facial recognition than uh, greater control of their data. So um, I think this relates with the point of cultural sensibilities, that each place has its own approach to data. And by the way, I'm not implying that we should pick security over data protection. I'm really trying to express that there are these differences in perspective. Thank you, Gustavo. There were other questions in the audience. Uh, Michael Weidinger from Democracy Without Borders. <clears throat> Isn't there a tension between this uh, uh, context thing on the one hand and the need for a global, more or less global identity on the other, and how should we proceed if we think that a global identity is necessary? I think there are many hundreds of millions of people who don't have an identity, and it's a big issue uh, that they get an identity, but this maybe needs to go be uh, beyond context-related identity proofs to a global perspective in order to assure this identity issue for every world citizen. Thank you for the question. I would like to ask Matthias to just comment a, this question. Just a, a, a brief comment on that. I, I totally agree that it might have very positive effects to 
conceive of such a uh, global identity. However, uh, there are also, uh, especially I think in, 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 in certain societies, huge issues with the idea of a, of a, of a universal database. And our, and our history, I think, has shown us that databases are never ever safe. So we would have to first really think hard about the technology to be used. There are alternatives, you know, there's for instance this great project called Three Words, if I'm not mistaken, which allows you to localize yourself on the whole globe just using three words. They have a database of three words, and you can pinpoint every uh, one meter, one square meter on the data on the world with one single, uh, with those three words, which is an alternative to traditional geographic location, and um, could be used by, by people who are disenfranchised by, for instance, not living in on, on, on streets which are mapped. So we still, I think, need to conceive of such a notion for um, for digital identity before we can proceed. Good. Any more comments? Other questions? No more questions so far, so um, I would like um, then to get back to the interesting example from Gustavo from Brazil. Tell us more about this. Very well. Um, I want to try to convey the story from the start. There is this Back then, he was not a senator, he was a candidate. He was, his name is Stevenson Valentin. And he, he, became, he began a campaign with a very, very unique twist. Um, he was looking for austerity, so he, he, it was a low budget campaign. And Stevenson, he, had, he was famous in the state for being a police officer with a, very, with a lot of integrity. He played a key part, a key role in applying the the, the law that about driving under in alcohol, under influence, and so he was a famous local figure, and he got elected based on that. Now he was also a victim of computer-generated industrial-scale disinformation campaigns, and this eventually led him to him and his team towards trying to figure out if well. This was based on AI. This, this was, AI is created on, based on data, of course, massive amounts of data. And that's how they started discussing ideas for an AI regulation. I, as a concerned citizen, and as someone from the same state, I, I am, I am, my experience is relevant to, to his case. I volunteered, I approached him, I wrote a report commenting on the Bill of Law, and now we are discussing it. But what is essential to this discussion is that the, the, the use of data for AI, or let's say the mis, misuse of data for something that is inherently against democracy, it is data used to generate industrial scale, computer gener generated truthful sounding gibberish and disinformation. This is affecting our, our democracies. And this is having a feedback loop on our regulation and our legislators who are struggling to frame the situation. And this may lead us to a, uh, a future of reduced development. Because if our laws are being created based on, on these experiences, we may be endangering development and the, the innovation in AI and in other fields. So I think that this relation between data and new technologies and how they can harm our democracies we, we really need to look into this with a lot of care. Thank you. So both of my sides here, we have two, two good examples, or also your research, and Nadine, goes in the same direction, so that we have both the benefits from the technologies and uh, social media channels and whatever. And um, we have the misuse of technologies in both cases, so maybe we can get an even better insight in your work and to um, also explain a bit more um, the, the two poles. Uh, so, yeah, exactly. So, uh, in, in a lot of cases, uh, social media were very helpful in order to push for democratization. In a lot of cases, this was already obvious in Europe for certain movements like Podemos, which was uh, pushing for that, but also in the Arab uprising where they were using uh, social 
media as a tool for uh, channeling their gri grievances and mobilization, and also for formation of counter narratives against authoritarian regimes. But as, as, as we are going f um, with the time, uh, there is the problem that uh, more and more of clusters are being formed and more and more uh, of like-minded people are forming through social media. And in this case, in period where you are searching for building consensus, that is something that is very important in democ democracy. This is not happening because w through clusters, it's only the mobilization of fear and the mobilization of certain narratives that are built. But but this is not the only thing. Another thing is that sometimes, uh, since the internet is so easy to use, sometimes you can use it as a tool for uh, collective action, as a tool for as to be an influencer on Twitter or Facebook. But then you forget that democracy requires to build actually structures that are sustainable and, and, and alternatives that are sustainable through time. And this happened in Egypt. So after 2011, it was so easy to use uh, Facebook as a tool uh, for uh, influencing people and Twitter and so on. But then you forget that uh, the time will come to the ballot box. And the ballot box is uh, asking for organizational sustainable structure. And in this case, those people who will build this structure in the real world, not in the virtual world, world will gain in the ballot box. And this happened already in 20, 2012, where anti-democratic forces gain election in 2012. So this is like one example, but there is others. But I'll keep it for the discussion. Mm -hmm. So there is a question from the auditorium. So um, actually more of a comment uh, concerning the regulation of social media and so on. Uh, my name is, by the way, uh, Christoph Sorge, professor of legal informatics at Saarland University and also a member of the Young Forum. Um, my concern is that if we try to regulate the um, influence in social media, uh, we could try AI regulation, but I think AI is not the problem. You can also hire 20 or 30 students uh, for a couple of dollars per hour who do basically the same thing that we criticize about the AI. So maybe we should um, try to, to regulate uh, one-sided influence, but that's an, um, a restriction of freedom of speech. Uh, so actually, the more you think about it, the harder it gets. Um, so my problem is we don't, don't really have a simple solution in that field. And I guess the whole community has to continue working on uh, trying to better understand the problem and regulation approaches as well. Thank you for the comment. Um, before we come to another question from the online community, I would ask um, Gustavo or Matthias. Um, um, Christoph just said there is no simple solution in terms of regulation, but what are the first ideas to do um, to get rid of the problem? Well, uh, I actually agree that it is quite likely too early to have, for any country to have a comprehensive AI regulation. I think we are working towards that, but I think the actual first step is a national, national AI strategy. Because the thing is, many countries are, are well, AI is estimated to generate $15 trillion, $15 trillion in the next 10 years. That is a fact that we cannot ignore. So for development, it is absolutely necessary that we create uh, an, an environment that fosters innovation. But we don't want to leave it absolutely vulnerable to abuses. So I, in a way, I agree that it is far too early to, to really implement AI regulation. But and the first step, I think, would be a na national AI strategy. And about 15, 15 countries in the world are working on that. So we, perhaps can, we, can, we can perhaps start discussing this in comparative ways. Perhaps, um, I, I totally uh, agree. Um, according to the, um, to the, to the write-up, I said that anyway, <laughs> what you just said, so that's fine. <laughs> no, um, but uh, perhaps to add a bit of, um, uh, of nuance, I think we should, first of all, stop talking about AI and start talking about automated decision systems and differentiate between automated and human decision-making systems. And we need both of them to interact effectively to ensure, um, to ensure a, um, well, a, uh, a human rights-sensitive uh, online uh, discussion sphere 
for some kind of content, pictures for instance, especially uh, sexual exploitation of children, uh, companies have very effective uh, tools uh, which they can use um, for other kinds of content, especially jokes or uh, hate speech with a national dimension that invokes certain historical prejudices. Their uh, automatic decision-making systems are just not able to do that right now. The semantic, um, the semantic power is still uh, f far off. But we need to just consider those two elements in tandem. We have not yet come to a final solution, but that's perfectly fine. I mean, there are always, always still yet now cases on freedom of expression in offline context. So we'll always grapple with these issues. May I add to that? Um, I think we're talking too much about regulation and not enough about users. And, um, and I think we also have to differentiate the users. I mean, there are those yes, we can regulate the social media, then those who really want to harm, they will just find another place that's out of the regulation. I mean, they're, it's just reality. They are quicker than we can think. Um, and then we have to think, talk about all the others who are the users. So all the humans, when we talk about data-driven democracy, and what we know from research is they are not stupid and they are damn lazy. Um, I mean, just think about how many times have you clicked on the second page on your Google results? I'm not making a poll here. It will not end well for you. Um, and we know that. We know, I mean, Facebook, Google, they allow privacy settings. It's just that we're so lazy that we don't do it. Um, and what we haven't understood so far is why we are so lazy. We just, we know, and, and so what we have to do is we have to talk about privacy by design. We have to talk about the design side um, that's not forcing us to make those decisions because we know, we, we, we know we're dealing with lazy pe people and then we have to build systems that accommodate that. Otherwise, when we don't have to talk about democracy. So one comment as well about national strategies. Who makes national regulatory strategies? Policymakers. Who are arguably the most clueless people you will ever meet about <laughs> digital innovation? Policymakers. So, a very concrete thing that needs to happen, this truly globally, um, in any country, in any government, we need to embed technical experts from the outside, from the private sector, from academia, into ministries and agencies re responsible for making these digital national strategies so that it's not just like, oh, we had a meeting with people who do AI and machine learning, so now I know that that's a thing. Uh, that's not enough. Uh, they need, we, there needs to be embedding between the public and private and academic sectors in this space so that the people who are building these systems understand the regulatory and policy realities um, that they're building in and likewise for the policymakers to, even if they will never fully understand, for them to have a higher level of sophistic sophistication than, than currently exists. Thank you. Um, I would like to take your question, and afterwards we will have the question from the online committee. Is it only one? Is it? Okay, good. <laughs> Hello, thank you for the discussion and this nice panel. I'm um, Christina Penner from Algorithm Watch, and I just wanted to challenge a bit the comment of Elke, because actually laziness is one point, but you have privacy, um, like information on the pages we use, and even if you start looking into these, it's not laziness, it's like pages, pages, pages of wrong information. If you file freedom of information requests, you don't get the answers either from the government policymakers or from the companies, because they know how to avoid whatever they want to avoid. It's not laziness by users alone. Like there's no um, yeah, usability or practical regress mechanisms, there's no a feasible, like transparency has to have different layers, explainability has to have different layers, and I think that's not on the users to just say, okay, I have to read all these cookie regulation or whatever is offered to me as the transparency tool that actually complies to regulation that is on hand now. So, Thank you for the question. One, uh, I have another question to you. So you said it's uh, transparency that is missing, but um, do you have an idea how to 
get what is might be the solution for the problem you were stating? I mean, do we have already a suggestion to that? <laughs> it's I mean, it seemed to uh, be that you have a suggestion. I think somebody who mentioned that in the beginning, we're like freedom of information request. Um, right that we now have in all European countries so that I know for, for the others I don't know to make them like Real like they don't work governments pay a lot of money to, to challenge them and to not answer them. So um, Like to make a practical regress process as possible you could have um, existing institutions involved to provide or check for you you could use initiatives like in Germany, there's Frag den Staat or My Data or whatever to facilitate these requests. You could, um, yeah, just to share some, like, like a layered um, responsibility to actually um, implement oversight mm -hmm. and rights implementation. Thank you. So this brings us back to the uh, question, who owns the data? Um, or how you earlier stated, uh, what was the term, not, not only owning it, um, Matthias, you were... I mean, do you have any comments to the question again, or should we proceed? Can, can I just comment to yeah, it? Okay. I mean, obviously, yes, they are, they are, I mean, it's a panel, so I need to be a little bit provocative. Um, there are many levels to that, uh, but what you just said, there are, there's this initiative, this initiative, and still it's not working. Why is it not working? Why are we not taking it up? Why are we not requesting a documentation to the data that we collect. I mean, open data is great, but as long as I have no idea who collected that data, who did what was that data, who interpreted a field in a very interesting way. And I can give you a very concrete example. So um, I think three, four weeks ago, I went to the World Health Summit here in Berlin, and I talked to uh, someone who collected data in India on, on health. And she said she had a lot of problems because she, one of the requested fields was a question, how many children do you have? And the answer was one boy, two boys, two boys, one boys. And so, hmm, that's a lot of boys in that country. And um, then she started talking to someone and at some point it turned out, oh, and yes, and my daughter just went to university. Your daughter? You never talked about the daughter. I said, well, it's not what counts. And that, that's really very, very oversimplifying now. Um, but as long as, I mean, in the database afterwards, it's just a number, two. And uh, we have to collect that A. So <sighs> laziness, we have, to, we, have to, we have to find a way to make us all more engaged, just to, to put push the, the responsibility to someone else, to the policymakers, take care, uh, will not work. To the companies, just take care, will not work. We somehow, and I don't know, I don't have, have the solution. We have to find a way that we all get more engaged. Otherwise, this will not end well. Are there technical solutions, Carmen? Yeah. I would also like to say some words on that because as a computer scientist, uh, the, the, what always puzzles me is that there's lots of discussion about I lo don't like this, I don't like that, how Facebook is to be used and what effects they are. But um, what is missing is somehow a, a counter design. So how should the usability, let's say, look like um, that allows you to, to check what data of you is uh, stored? Or how should the cookie on the websites that you visit should present it to you differently? So what would you like to have? So as a computer science, I'm always very happy if you come up with a desi design document, this is where the button should be, this is what I would like to have, and then they can implement it. Because at the end, it's, uh, everything is doable, everything is programmable, and uh, if you don't like it, then either find somebody who can do it or describe what you would like to have. So um, coming back to that, also to the point, um, to the usability and to the, to the laziness, I mean, of course, there are different interests involved. So on the one side, the, the big companies would like to collect the data, and uh, still they have to provide you the option to opt out. And uh, if, it's, if you don't opt out, it's still your choice. So how would you like to have that choice implemented, if not that way? So there's always, there's, my impression is that there's some creativity needed how to really get all these uh, requirements and all these uh, cases that you would like to have matched for people who don't have, want to have their data collected, for people who are oblivious about it, who don't care. So how would you like to have it all involved in one big 
technological solution. And if that's doable, then it's easy to program. As a non-techie, can I ask you a follow-up question on that? Would it be possible to make it device-based so that on your device, anything you access yes, is not? Yeah, that's very easy. I mean, it's very simple. I'm not sure whether you have set up sometimes websites. It's very easy if you want. But you anyway have a device-specific presentation of the content. So if you visit a web page on your uh, smartphone, then typically the, the, some of the menus are hidden. That's fluid design. And uh, you can differentiate based on the browser. There are lots of options. Just as a programmer mm -hmm. of algorithms in a very big sense, it's, uh, you don't have all use cases in mind. And if somebody's unhappy about how it is to be used, you don't get that feedback. And uh, actually, what I like um, also to bring into, so if we are unhappy about the data collection of some big companies, there are also lots of alternatives how it can, uh, that produce the same functionality. So there's not just Facebook. You can also use other social media sites if you want. But that's a, a choice nobody can take from you. Thank you. Let's come to the online uh, auditorium. What kind of question we have there? OK, there is a question from um, Mali, NGO Women. Uh, what is the definition and the usefulness of data governance and data sovereignty? And how can it be useful, or can they be useful to hinder blackmailing on the internet? Matthias, is it a question I can uh, forward to you? The first one? Uh, as, as a lawyer, I love abstract <laughs> questions. But you are, of course, right that every concept matters. Uh, we have to talk about data governance just as we have to talk about global governance. In global governance, we decide on which rules we want to develop to distribute rights and goods in a fair and equal way. In data governance, data governance, we have to discuss how to develop rules and how to ensure that data is uh, produced, collected, processed, um, distributed, and harnessed in a uh, way that we as a global society can agree on. That's, of course, very abstract, but you know, these are what, what notions are about. Um, data sovereignty, uh, on the other side, is a very, it's a very, a very f fluid idea that you, either as a state or you as an individual, are able to use the data resources that you produce and that you need uh, to take uh, decisions um, in a way that is not dependent on other uh, other um, other entities. So, for instance, it would be a violation of the concept of data sovereignty if you had no possibility to get the data back from companies which you use. So, data sovereignty, I think, is one of the key notions for the future. Even though we don't know, of course, yet quite how it is going to work out, there are no direct rights which you can trace to data sovereignty. But I believe that this idea of um, re-establishing um, uh, re-establishing sovereign decision-making on how to deal with your data is important. And that's why I'm not quite sure that using the word lazy is always the, the best one to do. I think people are just, you know, people. We use heuristics to make decisions. Um, you know, we are, the world is complex and we have only a limited time. Um, therefore, I think it's better to think about how we can nudge people towards the, the, the right decisions. Best example being, of course, privacy opt-ins versus privacy opt-outs. Thank you, Matthias. Gustavo. I think it's I I think it's better. I, I, well, I don't think it's good to frame it as laziness, as user laziness, because platforms are designed with goals in mind. So if Facebook wants people to share more data, they don't have to force you. They can display design elements and they can change the user interface to incentivize people towards that. And the reality of the matter is that the majority of people in the world aren't knowledgeable about data and internet governance and government surveillance and surveillance capitalism. They, they aren't informed about that. And if the platform by default uh, sets it so spreading data and creating data is easier, then most people will do that it's the same thing with um, cognitive biases. The human brain is, can be tricked in a variety of different ways, and that's, that's what marketing does too. 
So I don't think it's really useful to talk this about as laziness because it isn't so much that people are, are failing to, to really study and understand the situation, it's that design elements can be used to trick them. And if some of you are familiar, we have Lawrence Lessig's Code is Law theory, which says that human behavior can be influenced by regulation, laws, norms, that is moral norms, social norms, market forces, and architecture. Architecture being the elements of the world, either created or found. So code is also law, and we can, we can design websites, we can design the internet to, to control people's behaviors. So it is not so much laziness as it is um, intentional design by platforms. And when we, when we talk about, well, in Brazil, the, the, earlier this year, we had the Brazilian IGF. And there was a main session on which platforms were, or platforms were was a, platform responsibility was a, a topic. And after this, this discussion, we were talking, what could be the values of, of a platform regulation? And I was thinking, this is how I was thinking, um, how, can, how can we discuss the design features of a platform? Meanwhile, other people were, all, were about sover sovereignty. So we are still really trying to figure out what values we want for this. And um, I think it, it, this really interacts with the point of data, as in um, privacy by design. We are, privacy by design is this idea of trying to make it so by default we aren't uh, giving away so much data. So I think this is all really close together thematically. Thank you. Do we have another question? Yeah. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> this one is from a person in telecommunications. Um, so we see an acceleration of AI and IoT across the globe. And the makers of those work tirelessly to sell both to government and to private agencies. It becomes a scare with the government because in most cases they're not able to weigh the actual data transparency on all these devices. Can there be an effort to at least formulate a certain baseline and have the solutions compliant globally first so that they can be adopted or be localized in each region? And can that undertaking be possible? Can you, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, Not a problem. <laughs> Um, there is an acceleration of IoT and AI across the globe. And the makers of these platforms or these technologies work tirelessly to sell those to both government and private agencies. And it becomes a big scare with the government because in most cases they're not able to weigh the actual data transparency on all these devices. Can there be an effort to at least formulate a certain baseline and have the solutions compliant globally first so they can be localized for each region. Is that something that's possible? It's not quite clear to me, baseline of what? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think baseline yeah. of governance, yeah. data mm -hmm. governance, compliance uh, rules or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think so. so I personally don't think so. I think uh, that the technology developers, I mean, here we have two points. The one is AI, that's mostly software, where you just code and uh, there you don't have any restrictions at all. You can just program as you wish. And the second is the hardware uh, producers for the Internet of, uh, Internet of Things devices. Uh, and in, in the first case, I don't think that it's possible that uh, there will be a guideline for all AI programmers what restrictions they should apply to or what rules they should follow because it's, it's uh, just... So the, neither the programming language nor any further restrictions might apply. So you still can do whatever you want on the data you have in your private basement, whatever, where they program. And for the second part, part, part is uh, which devices uh, will be brought out. I mean, the, the, the intention is to, to, to sell those. There are some restrictions applying, especially in which uh, frequencies you are allowed to submit uh, some um, uh, data. I mean, not to interfere with other uh, transmissions on that um, on that uh, frequencies, but other than that, I think that's also not really regulated, and uh, 
the hardware producers can up, come up with devices, sensors, whatever they like. There's yeah, I, I agree and follow up on that. Um, it brings us back to that original point around context. You know, every country is going to have their priorities and their context and use cases, and so companies can't realistically be, be expected to, to make a common uh, baseline on their own, and governments certainly would never agree. Um, there's also the, the issue of the fact that, you know, as, as you said, to put it in other words, uh, companies are creating ahead of the curve of regulation. You can't regulate something that's only going to come onto the market two weeks from now. So uh, I don't think it's practicable um, in, yeah, in reality. We have another comment from uh, Gustavo and then Matthias. I, I think Jessica hit the nail on the head here that disruption is a business model and businesses can actively try to stay ahead of regulation and try to capture a market before regulation hits. So that is a point. I also think that many governments in the world don't, wouldn't really have an interest in this, in this common idea because really it is about making technology for your, your own reality and for your, your own national industry and so on. It could also raise some questions about security and centralization. So maybe we don't want, um, you know, country like A, B or C to have such a central role in AI. It is also good to keep in mind that AI is a highly dynamic technology. It, it has existed for quite a while, decades now but it, it goes through winters and then periods of rapid development. So it really is an unpredictable technology. Maybe in 10 years it will be completely different from now. We are still trying, much, much of the debate we have today about AI is more specifically about machine learning. And we're still struggling with the implications. So I think even if it was desirable and possible, I don't think the world and the countries are even ready to have this discussion of a, a minimum standard yet. Okay, Matthias, short comment on it. Yeah, I, I feel like I have to disagree a bit because we have a lot of minimum standards. They're called human and fundamental rights. And we don't need to reinvent them, you know. So when we talk about we don't have minimum standards, that just means, well, we haven't yet quite clearly established how exactly certain kinds of uh, sexual use of artificial intelligence, for instance, uh, can be done in a way not to endanger uh, large data sets, you know. For instance, AI in uh, hospitals or AI in, 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 in military technology. So I think we should be careful not to, not to um, convey the expression that we are entering a no man's land of, of, of regulation. We have laws. We have standards, we have uh, soft law standards. So we're not uh, entering a, uh, an unknown world. It's kind of a, um, a thing that comes back all the time in internet-related law discussions, you know? We don't need to reinvent everything. So first of all, don't believe that there's no <coughs> rule just because a technology is new. And also, it is not quite true that you can't regulate uh, for the future. It's difficult. It's difficult, of course. But just think about the um, uh, general data protection uh, uh, regulation um, and its right uh, to have access uh, to the logic of a decision by an automated decision-making system which, um, um, to which you are subjected. Such a, such a rule, uh, though it hasn't been implemented yet uh, uh, very often in front of courts, uh, is a good example of how you can uh, provide for uh, technology uh, neutral, future-oriented regulation. And the GDPR has been a success story. If you look at the California Privacy Bill, which is basically a copy of that. Okay, there was a question in the audience, please. <coughs> Hi, my name is Renata and I'm from Brazil. And uh, even though we know that data is not necessarily related to technology, we usually don't think of paper when you talk about data and data-driven democracy. So I'd like to take a step back and ask if you have any opinion and on how we could harmonize a data-driven democracy with those people that does not have access to internet and social media yet, especially in developing countries. Thank you. Uh, brilliant question. I'll have a go. Uh, okay. I was going to bring this up later, so thanks for that. Data-driven democracy is not just about Facebook. 
How do we use data to make our societies, for example, more inclusive and equitable? When we talk about democracy, democracy is incompatible with the gross economic inequalities we see today. That's in part why so many democracies all across the world, and uh, we're feeling it you know, even here in Germany, um, are, are struggling. Our democratic institutions and even the people's belief in, uh, in the democratic system are being shaken to their core because we are not solving people's challenges. The democratic states and systems um, have proven themselves not capable of creating an economic environment and a free market environment that actually helps lift um, all citizens equally and fairly. So data sh can and should also be used uh, to identify more effectively where and how uh, we need to improve public service delivery, for example. Um, and also, this means not only um, from government and public services, but also for companies to understand how do we create products and services and uh, go-to-market strategies and customer engagement strategies that work for everyone, that reach all customers. So whether we're talking about customers uh, for companies or citizens for governments, we can be using data to make our countries and our economies more inclusive. And in this way, you know, creating a data-driven democracy means also using data to reach people who are offline, um, who are marginalized, um, who are maybe even data skeptic and don't want to be online, that's fine, but they still need good healthcare. They still need access to uh, decent, uh, affordable, fresh groceries. Um, they still need access to school and daycare and all of this stuff. So um, this, I think, um, is really the low-hanging fruit when we talk about data-driven data democracy. Um, let's learn to use our data to solve analog problems as well, and in doing so, strengthen our democracies. So thank you. We are now into the second part of the discussion already, thinking of measures, um, how to realize a data-driven democracy. So continue. Yes, I have also an example there. Uh, how this can be done also in a privacy-preserving way. Because if you talk about data for democratic processes, then let's say you would like to know what's the average salary of the people in specific regions. What is the? So you want to gather some statistics, but actually you don't want to know the individual data of the people. So, um, and there's some example um, which uh, we were also somehow. Um, which I would like to refer to, uh, that was in Boston. The city council would like to, uh, wanted to, uh, to find out from, I think, 900, 1,000 uh, companies there, what's the, the gender pay gap, that's a prominent example, among the um, employees. And uh, they would not like to know the individual salary of person X, but they would like to have the statistics. And um, these, then, with the collaboration with the Boston University, they uh, used multi-party computation, which basically is a technology that allows you to submit um, somehow encrypted, somehow distorted data to computing parties, which individually cannot recognize their content, but together you can create uh, statistics out of that data. And then you can see really how is the differences among the different genders in, in salaries and other characteristics. So what I would like to, to um, yeah, point out that there's really technology available. If you would like to gather data from in this statistical form, you don't have to have the view on the individuals so that um, you can trace them for other purposes. And that's really also in, in improving the acceptance of such data gathering because um, they are not in any way endangered. Thank you for this insight um, to the technology developments. Um, we have two more questions from the online community. Um, <clears throat> this is one question from um, someone in sustainability. How do countries and communities in their diversity marry and find a consensus on values that will apply and be inclusive to the community as a whole? And who determines the ultimate values? If 
I may. Uh, this this comes back to the question of are there global uh, values and rights, and uh, I think this is what um, Matthias already answered earlier. But maybe you have a comment on that again. Yeah, but, I mean, it's, it's it's the basic question that. Um, ask us to consider what uh, values we want to ensure within our societies. We don't, again, need to reinvent everything. We have values, they're enshrined in constitutions, um, but we need to make sure that these values are still responsive to the challenges of online communication. One approach that provided some nuance to the discussion on values was, for instance, the publication on Monday by Sir Tim Berners-Lee of his contract for the web, where he uh, provided a new kind of social contract that illustrates quite clearly the demands uh, on states, on, the, on, on, on people and on companies. And their um, differentiated but uh, mutually dependent role in ensuring uh, values also in, um, in the next uh, generation of internet governance. But um, just one more thing. I, I really do believe that just as we shouldn't call for or shouldn't argue that there are no laws that apply or that we need to reinvent everything, we also should be really careful in criticizing uh, uh, the, the, the foundation of democratic decision making. So I'm really not so happy if we say on this panel that the democratic system is being shaken to the core. No, it is not. The, this kind of talk is, is sort of you know, blowing the, the, the pipe of the populists who want people to believe that. They want people to no longer trust in the system. They want people to believe that democracy is failing you. you we are not responsive to you. It's American companies uh, that, uh, that rule everything. Uh, so please be careful. Democracy is such an important goal. A lot of countries are striving to ensure democracy. So yes, it has its problems, but please let's not uh, throw away the, the baby with the bathwater. <coughs> Hooray, our first real controversy on the panel. <laughs> I completely disagree. And I would say, to use your words, please be careful. Because the, how do you say Gleichgültigkeit in English? Um, the, Gleichgültigkeit. Uh, <laughs> what is the word for um, the apathy, haha, the apathy uh, that right now is creeping into mainstream society in the strongest democracies in the world. That is the first serious crack in the wall. Have you ever and been so, to Fridays for Future? I'm sorry? Have yes, I have. That's but, very apathic, right? Um, so the fact that there is Fridays for Future does not mean that the mainstream society uh, are, are there. I mean, if, if anything, Fridays for Future, firstly, very inspiring, and by saying democracy is being shaken to its core does not mean um, that nobody is doing anything. We care, they care, that's fantastic, but it's not enough. Because if anything, when we see Fridays for Future and um, Extinction Rebellion, etc., you know, this gets good press in, um, in you know, the Guardian or what have you. But who's reading it? Uh, who's actually showing up? It's the same. So we are in our bubbles, our voter bubbles, our com online community bubbles. Um, the average citizens across, um, like if we're talking about, about Europe now or North America, uh, the average voter um, is not showing up to Fridays for Future. And I think that to, you know, these two realities can coexist. And the fact that there are these youth-led movements appearing does not negate the fact that our democratic institutions are being challenged in a way unprecedented in our generation, or since the, uh, you know, since the end of the Cold War. Just one, one sentence. If you're saying that two realities can coexist, you are doing fake news. Two <laughs> realities cannot coexist. Different interpretations of one reality can exist. And I totally admit that democracy has its challenges. I think that's more of a semantic distinction than anything. Uh, but words matter. Reality is complex. Yes. <laughs> One more comment from Kalman, and then I want to try to make a poll with all of you. You can already think of your answers. I would ask you to raise your hands one, uh, whether you can uh, support the one position or the other one. So <laughs> is the, um, uh, the democracy um, endangered by the stated problems or not? So 
Yeah, I wanted to, to pick up the, the question and answer to it and also involve your comments. Uh, the question was uh, whether we can have a consensus on the values and uh, I think this is exactly what is now taking here place on the, on the panel that maybe there are different values and they, I'm not sure whether they will be a consensus possible. And um, also when we uh, did some new technologies, how to, to get the opinions of people, how the democratic discourse can take place, at the core, you can uh, have full transparency of the arguments, of the facts, and still people come to different um, decisions, whether they, they are for or pro or contra. And uh, this all relates to the values they have. Some prefer security over, over uh, freedom. Some um, think that the environment is more important than the personal um, lifestyle. And um, this is something that is difficult to come bring into a consensus. So I think we can have not just two realities, but uh, very different values and how we interpret the world and what we find for ourselves um, valuable to live for. Um, yeah, uh, my position is like uh, in the middle, which is that as far as people are engaged and are asking for and fighting for their values, then there is a hope for a certain position to gain over the others. So all depends on who is engaged for, to fight for which value. Thank you. There's another question from the online community. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from the technical community again uh, to Professor Dr. Elke Greifeneder. <laughs> she mentioned that technology must meet up with society and the online participant wants more clarity on that. I'll, I will cite now. Uh, how can that be done? Because I would think that it's the other way around, where society must meet up with technology. Being in the fourth industrial revolution, society needs to adjust to this ongoing inevitable change. Coming from a country that faces a lot of challenges in terms of progression in technology, how do we protect and store data so that it may influence the wide channels? Thank you. Um, there are a lot of perspectives or, or aspects in that question. Um, when I'm saying that users do not adapt to systems and technology, um, it means that, yes, I mean, there's, there's no way we, we have to build a system, but we always have to keep in mind that they will use it as it fits them. And a very practical exa example are um, um, dietary apps. And uh, there are a lot of studies on people who suffer from anorexia, but do not know that there are actually apps to help them. So what do they do use? They use dietary apps to overcome anorexia, which means every time they're gaining weight, which is good, the system tells them that's bad. But they're still using it. So they're still they're, 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 they're taking the pieces out of the things. So um, to come back to that question, I think what we have to do is we, sh we shouldn't just throw a system out and then say, here it is, great, but have more like, I mean, we talked a lot about user-centered design, and I think the term that's right now more in coming on is, is more like co-design because the user-centered implies you invite the users to give a nice feedback and then you say, hello, goodbye users, thank you. Um, now we finish developing our product. Um, whereas co-design is more longer process where you keep being in contact with the users, where you, where you keep monitoring okay, what actually happens, how do they use it, and how should we, how maybe we need to adapt. Does that answer the question? You were talking about uh, co-design or participat mm. um, participative um, design or development of technologies. Um, I have the question, how can we uh, do this with, uh, I mean, have a participatory approach in terms of regulation? I mean, this is what the conference is all about, we are here, but what are practical steps, Matthias and Gustavo, uh, to, to get there? What are the next steps? I think we can always talk about um, participative drafting of bills of law, 
but that is perhaps not uh, not as incisive as powerful as we are as we want it is it really is a difficult question how to do it um, there are many ways we could try of course um, multi that's why we have multi stakeholderism for um, I've had very productive discussions here with platforms and on how to improve them and on how to deal with these, these issues. Matthias, do you have any other insights? I think you, you really hit it uh, uh, on the head here. We first have to ask the right questions, but we're doing here, that's really great. Um, and we can go back to the toolbox, toolbox of regulation. Again, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And me saying that a couple of times shows you how important it is not to reinvent the wheel. Um, so we can go back to the regulation, regulational tools we have, but they should be informed by new insights into, um, into how humans interact with technology. We haven't talked about affordances yet, affordances of products. What do products make us do? And how can technology shape how uh, products make us do? So sort of the, the pull into the, the, the void to enter something uh, in, a, in, a, in a blinking box if the program asks you, so what did you do today? Um, these are aspects which we need to take into account when drafting new rules, and those rules need to be very smart, which, is, which isn't a, a problem because, you know, uh, societies are getting uh, progressively smarter, and parliamentarians too. So yes, sometimes policymakers are not the, the most, uh, let's say, the most uh, innovative ones. They can't because that's not their specific role. But just that parliamentarians are now here, have gathered for the first time in an IGF from across the world. I've talked to parliamentarians from Ghana, from the US, from, um, from, from Kazakhstan. So it's really great that they're here, and I think we're going into the right direction. But perhaps that's just, that's just my, my sunny Austrian nature. I also have some uh, comment on how co-design could take place. I mean, there are two options. So once uh, the, the first option is when companies uh, to come up with technology, of course they have some user studies and they evaluate how it will be perceived. But it's, if it's about um, more, uh, it, the second point is open source movements where users could also come up with their own ideas and I mean that's happening all the time. There are always new projects popping up. Uh, they will not be successful mostly but there is uh, progress going on and if co-design is desired then maybe it would be good to also um, um, join in on GitHub and wherever these open source ac programmers put their code and they also ask for, for um, comments and for discussions. So it would be very helpful as a practical uh, proposal to, to join in such open source projects, although not being a programmer and just to give feedback, just to help and to give suggestions how the design should look like, what functions should be in, because uh, sometimes the programmers are also very happy to get that insights and that feedback. Thank you. Um, Jessica, um, I would like to ask you if you have any um, idea of how to solve this problem from your practical perspective. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, touching on what you just said, uh, you know, engaging the users um, in the design process, and this links back also to, um, to previous comments around inclusion, you know, reaching out to communities that are not already in online fora and giving feedback on um, digital tools, but going, going to rural areas, for example, or to uh, older communities uh, you know, elderly citizens, uh, for example, and engaging with them and seeing how can our products, services, and technologies uh, help solve their problems. I mean, understanding the user is, is at its core and understanding their context. And I think um, in this way, you know, as the question was formulated, how do you help soci bring society to the technology rather than the other way around? You know, this also, when, when you can show someone that this uh, new technology doesn't bite, but is actually gonna solve a problem for you. It's gonna make your life easier. Um, then, then that incentivizes engagement and incentivizes use. So, you know, you need, to, you need to ask yourself, what problem am I trying to solve and for whom? And then when, that, when you've identified that who, then ask yourself, who's, who's, not, who's not in there and should be? Who have we not spoken with? That, that we should, um, and, um, and then designing accordingly. And I think, you know, in the long term, whether it's from the product development side or the regulatory side, 
um, or the customer slash citizen engagement side. Um, this is also, um, for in terms of concrete recommendations, uh, something that we need to create for a where we're bringing all three together, the citizen slash customer, the product developers and creators, and the, the, regulatory, uh, the regulatory advisors and uh, policymakers, to have them speaking with each other to solve the common challenge and identify new opportunities. And, and you know, there are many different ways this could be structured, but I think there needs to be um, a bit more, more motivation and proactive engagement, um, perhaps on the public sector side, to create those fora, to say, hey, we are in the process in the Ministry of X to, uh, to improve our, um, our strategies and policies um, around digital issues in this sector, uh, and then actively reaching out to citizens and to companies and bringing them together um, to, to gather that feedback. Thank you. There's another question from the audience, please. Hello, I am Cintinaya Cantanhete from Brazil. And I was just uh, going to comment towards what you say, because I also came from a rural area. <clears throat> because I also came from a rural area. And the thing is that, as you say, these people can also be included in technology, for example, when it comes to agriculture. Using technology can increase sustainability. So how can you, you think we can address these communities, but the people that are involved, like the people who are working in agriculture, the students and things like that, and how civil society can work with these local communities and take this discussion abroad, for example, because what I, what I see as someone who came from that place is that we are discussing this here, but the education system that we have that is still so traditional does not allow these people to be actually engaged and to understand how they can improve the work that they are already developing along with technology. So that should be it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, it's about informing. Absolutely, and also at a certain extent, incentivizing. Uh, the, the agriculture example uh, is, is fantastic. You know, I, I once worked on a rural development project in Afghanistan, and uh, this would be true um, whether it was in Afghanistan or in Germany, but farmers are stubborn. Farmers do what they know. Hey, my family's been doing it this way for, you know, for five generations. Why should I change? What this fancy new type of seed, or not to mention some digital technology? Uh, I don't want to mess with the system that I know works for me. And and so, you know, just taking that sector as an example, you have to not just tell but show, show results, demonstrate results, and that involves engagement of civil society. That requires also subsidies and incentives for, for people to use it, you know, and demo plots or, or what have you to show, hey, this will make your life easier, increase your crop uh, productivity and reduce your, your output costs, blah, blah, blah. You know, this key. Or if we're talking about education and school systems, teachers, etc., being stuck in their ways, well, that's where the incentive has to be um, getting a little bit harder and, and also creating disincentives to not changing. You know, if they just want to be a bit lazy and keep doing what they know, um, don't want to be fussed, uh, that's where the government has to step up and enforce and say, if this is the new standard that we're using in our school system, then you have to do this or um, you'll lose your job, for example, as an extreme case. But, but also, you know, making it easy for people to adapt or as easy as possible. You're not just saying, hey, here's a new system, now you have to use it, but giving trainings, workshops, gathering their feedback, you know, rather than just dumping something um, supply-driven in their laps and say, now you have to use this, making sure that they're part of the process from the beginning, so both the teachers and the principals and the school administrators, should, you know, and the students. What are your current haves, needs, and wants? What's working for you now in the current system and what's not? And how can we co-create the solution using these new digital tools that are out there? You know, Because I think if people are part of the process from the beginning, then it feels less like, OK, do this now, and, and more like, hey, we're, we're co-creating this new system. I, they've at least had my feedback, and I know what's coming. I know what to expect and why. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you for that question. 
Thank you. Um, Jessica, thank you for the last question uh, from the audience. Um, we are before to end this session, and um, coming to an end, I want to invite all of you panelists to give a short last statement, like not more than 30 seconds um, that are left for every one of you. Could be a call for action, a summary, or um, some insight you gathered today. So please, Matthias, start. We don't need new rules. We need new data and better data about how to best use data for the societal good. We need to find a way to make you, the users, in a more general way, feel that they are part of and that they can have a decision and that they're not just providers of data. Um, I'll take my statement to answer indirectly to Cindy. I think civil society in, in academia, now that I think about it, we should exchange more experiences with research centers, like, for example, the Berkman Center, because they have very interesting methodologies which we could use to try and reach out to these populations and then bring, that, bring back this information to developers. So I would really suggest improving and learning more about research methodologies. Uh, why we don't think about more transparency. So, for example, about uh, the disclosure of the sponsors of uh, social media advertisement, uh, since this has a big effect on the transparency and the good functioning of democracy. I would like to advocate for a more, more privacy-preserving computing options that allows to keep the data of the users private so they are happy and the companies can also calculate in it and they are happy as well. I would like to call for the creation of an inclusion certification for digital products. So just like we can certify an agricultural product as uh, organic or fair trade, we should have some kind of distinction for digital products and services that say this product was created uh, for all potential users, whether on the basis of gender, ethnicity, skin color, age, mobility, et cetera. I believe this um, is a new, uh, a new distinction that, uh, that we need to introduce. Dear panelists, thank you so much for uh, the last statements, uh, which are also the bottom line for me. Um, I thank all of you for your expertise and the audience and online audience also for um, the questions and the fruitful discussions here. I thank um, Sissi and Ida Beleng for your work and especially Matthias and uh, Sissi because they've been the mastermind behind this um, workshop today. Thank you so much and hope to see you again. <laughs>